Well, good morning and happy Monday. Still up in the Pacific Northwest, going to be traveling out to some, a river property today and spending the rest of the week out there. Should be fun. It's supposed to rain like crazy, but they need it. They need it up here. We had a fishing trip scheduled to float the river, the Salduck River, and I think it's only about this deep. So that's probably not going to happen. We're going to talk about the frenzied iBuyer activity that happened in August. We were looking at what they purchased in July which was a record amount of homes that they purchased. And uh, I kind of said, gee, looking at, looking at that number, I'll bet they're going to be up in the uh, over 1,000 number by August. And yikes, did they ever. But let's look at where we're at with a seven-day moving average right now. And we are at 7550 as a listing count today, which is pretty good uh, for a Monday, 7567. Um, normally we're we're well below 7,000 units. So uh, what that means here on the seven day moving average is you can see that it's almost a mirror image of the 4th of July, but inventory in the blue line is starting to come up and the sales are following. So uh, there is some inventory increasing out there and we can take a look and compare it to what I'm seeing in the Cromford report for the week. They kind of track it, uh, you know, the same way. So let's take a look and see what's going on there. And we have um, inventory coming up in the active listing counts by about, oh, we were 67.53 back in September 4th. And now we are a week later, <coughs> almost 7,000. You can see it's finally starting to come up. What's going to happen is October, we're going to see it climb. And then here you can see the past four years, this is November. And that's a blank screen. So this is November and we start trending down for the holidays. So that's going to happen. There's no avoiding that. People just pull back their listings on the holidays and away we go. So October, you know, could be a little bit of relief for buyers if we get more inventory. Um, it's it's going to be interesting. Carlos here says, I'm afraid of losing my job, as I'm sure others are. What could that do to the real estate market if millions might myself? are laid off. Uh, let me talk about that for a second. Cause, um, in, oh, and, and when I talk about to you about this iBuyer activity, let me know what you think in the comment section, Carlos, you know, when we had the stay at home order, it came in March, I was convinced that there would be such heavy job losses that it would affect the real estate market. And the only thing that saved it was a central bank intervention and stimulus checks. So it's really hard to tell if we have an economic event where millions of people lose their jobs, uh, what they're going to do. The Fed is kind of out of bullets. So it's going to be uh, reliant on whatever the Treasury decides to do. So we just don't know. There's no easy answer for that one. Now, I can tell you that when we had um, last March, when spring training got canceled in, in Phoenix, that all of these iBuyers canceled all their contracts. Now, I haven't seen the contract language that shows me whether or not they, you know, let you keep an earnest money deposit, but they just, they, they all three just shut down and they were citing safety concerns and what people going in and out of houses. But wait a minute, you canceled homes that were already under contract. So how much traffic was there really? You may be sending an inspector into a home and that's it. Um, you know, you may be sending people in to do repairs. So I kind of believe that about this much. I think they just got scared and said, housing's going to go down like crazy. And that's what I thought last March. I thought, here comes the unemployment. This is going to be devastating, but they just shut down. Absolutely shut down. Um, forbearance, uh, is running out now, Carlos. Uh, but if we have Something else like this come up, it wouldn't surprise me if they reinstate it. So you just got to stay close. You're not going to lose your job. I know that. So <laughs> I hope you don't. Nobody loses their jobs. Um, it's interesting times. So anyway, they just they just cut bait. They just they just stopped doing uh, um, housing at all, and it was it was frustrating to me. Um, I I was actually pretty mad about that. I said, how can they just cancel a contract? But let's look at what's going on now with these iBuyers 
and uh, in our daily observations here with uh, Crawford, it's interesting. Bit of an eye chart for you, it's small, but homes purchased in August in total was 1,145 homes compared to last August where they only purchased 181. I mean, look at that. That's an increase of 533%. Out of that, they sold 384 this August and only sold 129 last August. So their sales are up 198%. But here's the real kicker. Homes purchased in August 2020 was averaging $254,000, 260 for the group. This year, 439000 They have moved into that price point that they used to stay out of. And they had to because prices gravitated up to between four and 500000 So they didn't have a lot of, a lot of choices there. Um, but then if you look, and I lost my place here for a second. It says here, and this I didn't know. Um, it said... Uh, let's see. We note that the I buyers are paying more for the homes than they are buying than the homes that they sell during the same month. The majority of the homes do not sell the same month that they are purchased, though it's becoming more common as an increasing number are sold to institutional investors. We should remember, and this is what I didn't know, we should remember that the buy price is gross and includes the service charge that the I buyer makes to the seller. What is the service charge? Okay, here's some simple calculations. In most cases, when an eye buyer makes an offer to your house, it's not going to be the full retail price. So they're, you're going to pay for convenience because, you know, eye buyers are cash and you can pick your closing date. And uh, if you've used an eye buyer, let me know. Let me know how it went. So um, let's say your house has got a market value of $412,000, $415,000. Chances are, and they're closing the gap a little bit, but chances are they're probably going to offer you something around 400,000 and you're going to look and go, okay, well, that's about 12,000 lower than what the market is, but gosh, I get cash. I get to close quick. This is going to be fabulous. But then they charge you a 7.5% service fee. So on a $400,000 house, that's 30 grand. It's not a commission. It's a service fee. It's kind of a tricky thing when it comes to the multiple listing service and the, uh, Arizona Association of Realtors. So the service fee is then included in the price of the home. So now the home, as far as recording in the MLS is being sold, sold for $430, not $400. That I didn't know. And that is very interesting. So now you're looking and you're saying, well, what is the impact of all this iBar traffic doing on current prices? Probably not much because they're only inflated with their service price. Now they go in, clean the carpets, repaint, make them look good. And they either sell them and put them on the MLS as an active listing, or they sell them to institutional buyers who are using them now for rentals. Uh, but they really haven't inflated the price because they gave you a lower offer price on where the market was. In this case, um, maybe, yeah, uh, Jackie's asking me if I can repeat that. I'll repeat that. Um, it's very interesting. And then we have another question. Was going to use offer pad in January, but the service charge and fees was going to kill my net. So we went south. Um, yeah, Jackie, what, what the Cromford report is saying is that um, they're adding the service fee onto the price of the house. So if it's a $400,000 house and they're charging 7.5%, that service fee is now included as the actual total price of the purchase because it's not a commission. So it goes from 400,000 to 430,000. Um, I, I'd like to see a little bit more data on that, but um, I can't imagine a crime for the report being, you know, those guys are pretty accurate. So that's uh, that's an interesting thing. The median price of homes sold in the overall market has increased by only 26%. So the, Price of the home is not being inflated by them, but here's what's happening. We have um, um, we have 7,500 homes right now, and they 1,900 of them are almost all iBuyer homes, but a lot of what they hold never show back up on the MLS. So let's say they bought 1,100 homes now. Um, the institutional buyers are probably buying them before they're even listed on the MLS, so they'll just show up as closed. So on the sales numbers, all of the houses they bought and they sold are going to show up, but they're not all going to 
show up at listings. So we can't look and say there's 7,500 homes today and out of that, 2,000 of them are iBuyer homes because they don't put them all in the MLS. The other thing is they never previously showed up as active listings because buy sellers are, they're not listing them on the, on the MLS and then the iBuyers find them. In some cases they do, but it's a small number. So the sellers are reaching out to these iBuyers for the convenience of selling their home online and getting a cash offer. So they're not rolling into the inventory numbers, but they are showing up in the sales numbers. I hope that makes sense. But they're going after it in a frenzied, frenzied uh, pace right now. And, and Jackie says, uh, that's total manipulation of the market. You know, there's parts of it I really don't, I really don't like. I don't like that they have all of this venture capital and that it's coming in and disrupting markets. That I don't care for. I don't know how you regulate it. I don't know how you change it. Um, they obviously think that's going to be the future of, of buying homes is uh, real estate agents won't be needed. They are looking at that, like uh, buying car insurance, you get on, click, 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 got your car insurance. The challenge is trying to merge all of the agencies together between lending title and all the regulations. Uh, it's not quite as smooth as you think it's going to be. And as those of you that are real estate agents out there know, the stickiest part of the whole transaction is not getting the offer price and not submitting all the proper forms. It's getting things repaired, helping people with moving dates, changing things, waiting for stuff to come out of underwriting, uh, making sure that you're crossing all your T's and dotting your I's can't be done with a mouse. Eventually, I'm sure somebody's going to figure out a way where you can buy a home uh, just clicking online and sell a home. So that's the goal. And that's where the venture capital is going. But how long will this continue? If prices just remain flat, they're not making money now. They're barely making money. Open door is kind of doing okay. Um, OfferPad is the more conservative of the three. But their data is showing them that the final quarter between now and Christmas is going to be good. So they usually use the service fee as a margin for their profit. So you figure they bought it for 400 but they charged you $30,000 to do that. And then when they relist it, they have to pay anywhere from 2.5 to 3% to the buyer's agent. And so that say, well, where, and then if they find a bunch of things that, that need to be repaired, they take it out of your money, not theirs. So they say, well, we found $5,000. We need in repairs. We'll just credit you a close of escrow. Well, again, they built in a little margin. They probably got in, got it repaired for 2,500 instead of 5,000. So their margin is they're, they're squeezing it tighter and tighter because they're playing in a higher price range and they're trying to be more competitive, especially against each other. So if real estate goes flat or turns down at all, I don't see how this is sustainable. It's going to be very interesting. Um, Jackie says here that uh, real estate is an emotional purchase. Buyers, I believe, will always have the need for our guidance. It's a tough time. Uh, I've seen clients just be... Uh, very calm through about three quarters of the transaction and then go crazy. <laughs> it's stressful. Um, the So if the market starts to turn a little bit, how are they going to make the money? Are they going to charge more for a service charge? Uh, they're going to have to figure that out, but they're greater minds than me and they understand the math. But if you're looking now, you know, in April and May, they should have been scooping things up like crazy back then because real estate was going up at three and a half percent per month. It's not clipping along that fast right now. It may take them four months to go up 3%. And all that escalation of 3% does is offset the commission that they're going to have to pay. But if they're already coming in on a $400,000 house with a $30,000 buffer that they already have in there, um, I don't see that being a problem. They really look to try and walk away and only make about $5,000 on the home. They make more than that. They're lucky. So it's all about volume. So this buyer traffic that we're seeing out there is going to be very interesting to watch. Are we getting squeezed out as buyers? Maybe. But again, it goes back to what I said about they never show up on the MLS anyway. So how are we getting squeezed out? It's not like we're competing against them and they're trying to outbid us. That portion of the purchase doesn't happen. I haven't seen where I go in and I write an offer for a house and in comes an iBuyer that says, I'm going to beat Rick's offer. Haven't seen it. What I've seen is, oh, I didn't know the house was even available for sale. Well, we just decided we wanted to go ahead and go with them because the offer looked good. And uh, 
and it was a quick closing. So yeah, I know we kind of took a bath a little bit on the uh, net proceeds, but it was convenient for us. And we have so much equity now that we thought we'd go ahead and do it. So that's not squeezing you out of the transaction. Um, maybe they will eventually, but right now, not seeing it. It just kind of shows up and you go, wow, I didn't know that number was that big. And it used to be that they were only running about 3% of our total sales. So a lot of agents just said, well, I know they're out there, but I'm not feeling it. Well, now they're up around 9, 10%. So um, if you are thinking about selling to an iBuyer, I suggest you go ahead and contact an agent and say, hey, um, I'm going to submit my house to an iBuyer because here's what they do. They will let an agent represent you for like 1%. They'll handle a transaction. They'll handle a repair. And I have gotten that repair list pared down before from an iBuyer by detailing out what it, you know, look, hey, this doesn't cost this much. Are you kidding me? Um, I've also got the offer price to come up, but the trick is don't submit your request to sell your home to any of these people to find out what price you're going to get until you have an agent that's going to work with you because the agent can log in and submit your house as an agent. It doesn't cost you any more money. That 1% they pay the agent comes out of their, their margin. So you still have the 20, the, the, uh, uh service fee of 0.7, 7.5%. That doesn't change, but instead of making $5,000 on a house, maybe they only make, you know, you know, 2000. So, but an agent can get in there and say, you know, I, I see what they've done. Um, I think we can change this. Um, uh, v counter says everyday buyers would have, would have had more options if these greedy eye buyers weren't getting first dibs on a huge majority of single family homes. Take, they take away any extra options for families. Um, have one here. It says this company is offering more than market value with 3.1% service fees. This is going to change a lot. Uh, it's going to be all over the map. So if they've dropped from 7.5 to 3.1, they're squeezing their margins. So it's going to be interesting to see. Now, as an agent, we are not allowed to talk about the big Z because they are in our MLS and our board rules, or you cannot talk about other brokerages. So I can only refer to them as one of the three. So I can't say anything good or bad about them. I know it's kind of screwy, but that's just the way the rules are. But get an agent to help you out before you decide you're going to click with one of these guys. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens after the first of the year. They're gobbling them up right now because they think they can move them. And I believe they can. So let's uh, keep a close eye on it. Everybody have a terrific Monday. I should be live every morning this week. I'm going somewhere where they've got good Wi-Fi. I'm hoping I can have the river in the background, but it's supposed to start raining buckets. So wish me luck. Have a great rest of the day. Take care.